Um, welcome. Welcome to uh, the first uh, lecture that we call the annual lecture of Neighborhood Center for Life in the Universe. So we decided to start this series, which means uh, uh, bringing uh, in Cambridge um, a senior scientist working on that topic, usually from abroad. And, uh, and we have an immense privilege uh, today to have Dimitar Saslov. Uh, visiting us actually for almost a week right now, so I'm pretty sure some of you had a chance to have informal discussion with him. Um, it's an immense privilege because I think if there is a name that comes about uh, the work being done uh, as a kind of a visionaire or pioneer into this, uh, this topic, combining fields together, bringing astronomies, chemistries, and a science, it's certainly one of them. So it's a great pleasure to have him. I mean, is he started as an astronomer, actually, uh, in, um, in, uh, in Bulgaria, in Sofia, and then did his PhD there. Once PhD was not enough for you, you had another one in Toronto, in Canada, and then uh, Dimitar moved um, to Harvard uh, with a professor position in 98. Um, it's about the time when I, I had the chance to, uh, to work with Dimitar. At that time, the exoplanet boom started with all the transit techniques, all the planets techniques, and, and Dimitar did quite a substantial amount of work on that topic. And then gradually, he kind of moved away, he drifted away from astronomies, and uh, one day he announced the creation in 2006 of something that was really an alien, I mean, clearly uh, in the world of science, which is the origin, Harvard Origin of Life initiative. And uh, it was an alien because at that moment, I think the field of astronomy related to exoplanet was certainly not as developed as it is today. And, and there has been some work, and there was some work, and chemistry part definitely at that moment. But, but it was really the beginning. And, uh, and I think a lot of us, I mean, including me, got absolutely inspired by this. And, uh, and since that time, we, we kept working together. So that's why I think it's a, it's a great privilege to have you here today uh, and telling us about, in a way, the story of an astronomer about the origin of life. Please, Dimitar, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Didier. Mm. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, that's very kind of you. But uh, it is indeed very satisfying to me uh, to see the new center uh, that now has taken full uh, swing here at, uh, um, in Cambridge, in Cambridge, proto-Cambridge. Uh, so congratulations uh, on your new center. And uh, I'm very, very excited that we are already partnering in what we call the Origins Federation to work together, to raise money together, to work together, to exchange. Uh, because the future of any field of science is the next generation, in particular in this one. Because we, the old people, are still astronomers and chemists. And we need people who can be both. And it's only in that new generation uh, that we see that will happen. So it's a very exciting time to be in the field of life's origins. Uh, but because I'm a, uh, trained as a physicist and come from astrophysics, I will give you the view from astrophysics necessarily. That fortunately involves planets. We astrophysicists uh, claim exoplanets as our own still until the planetary scientists slowly but surely take them away from us. So anyway, it's uh, really fun. So because I'm an astronomer, I do have a lot of influences which are relatively recent uh, from mentors and uh, uh, people who are teaching me or have taught me uh, the very little that I know about uh, the chemistry that is involved and intertwined um, in this big and exciting project. And one of them, unfortunately, passed away three months, four months ago, Albert Eschenmoser. And I like to quote him here because it is one of the potential questions you may have at question and answer afterwards, is, is this really how life would start on the early Earth? And I have to say that what we really try to do, or what Albert Eschenmoser was suggesting, is that you first and foremost, as a chemist, which I'm not, but as a chemist, he advised that you start by trying to figure how it could work. The chemistry has to work, obviously. 
It has to be a specific type of chemistry that is very pure, self-purifying, um, that works. And then you worry about whether this is how it happened on early Earth or on other planets. Uh, as this uh, has progressed over the years, and particularly the last 10 years, we have actually more and more, and we, it includes my colleagues uh, in chemistry, of course, to understand that the two are very intertwined, the two chemistry, the astrophysics, the influence, the external influence of the environment is very intertwined with how and why the chemistry would work and maybe solve that big puzzle. So you have to work together, not just as people, but also as concepts and actual experiments. But you have to start with the understanding that this may be the solution may be multiple origins of life. So the other influence is still ongoing, and I'm happy to report is somebody who is still very much alive, in fact, sitting right here, right on the right-hand side, John Sadon. Uh, and uh, we collaborate a lot, and you'll see some of the common work here. But um, basically, John likes to say that unconstrained organic chemistry or synthesis creates a mess, and really a mess from which you cannot come out. Or like Matt, Matt Pounder, another chemist here, likes to say, there's too much clutter, you have to get rid of the clutter. And that's what chemists do in their labs, but they're not there at the origin of life, so who is going to do it for them? It has to be the environment and the chemistry. So it has to be a chemistry which can do, do it, and an environment which can help the chemistry do it. So both of them together. So that is essentially the theme of this talk, okay? That I want to impress on you that the chemistry has to be extremely selective and self-purifying, and that this is a combination of choosing the right chemistry, nature obviously found a way, and that may be also uh, the environment. So choosing the right place at the right time with the right chemistry. So other characters that will participate or come up in this talk are sitting around that table, which is just a picture from a month ago, uh, in the other Cambridge, uh, post-Cambridge, not proto-Cambridge. And they are David Catling from uh, University of Washington, whom you will see is a geochemist that helps us a lot with the environment. And my graduate student, Furkan Osturk, whom many of you might have seen talk about some of this work, as he did most of it, and uh, this will be just adding on, on what he already told you a few months ago. So uh, what I'm planning to do is introduce that topic of how do we understand the geochemical environment and the astrophysical environment, the way at least I see it from a cosmic perspective, and we'll give you two examples. One of them has to do with the uh, need for development of something which we call biological homochirality. And the other one has to do with the next step, which is once you figure out how to make polymers that are functional, how do you actually connect that, those functions to the environment? Is the environment a way to control those functions? And so let me start with the broader perspective, which actually is at the end as well. But the general approach I have here is, and one should have, is that you have to start with some sort of reagents, we call them feedstocks, um, which will then produce uh, the molecular building blocks. And you probably know uh, the elements and um, the uh, compounds uh, at the feedstocks and the molecular building blocks, are, of course, the nucleotides which make DNA and RNA, the amino acids for proteins and polypeptides and the lipids for membranes. Then they have to self-assemble into polymers and not just to self-assemble into some mess, but be functional. And functionality is very important. And in the end, this is not life yet. This is just prebiotic chemistry. You have to end up with something which is cell-like or behaves like a cell or behaves like a living system. We hope to achieve that in the lab, not very far from now, uh, but that must have happened at some point early on the uh, surface of this planet. And so 
um, until you see generations which can self-improve and eventually become, eventually become self-sustaining. That is, they do not depend on the feedstocks and the molecular building blocks being delivered to them by Uber Eats or <laughs> some other online service, meaning from the environment. They are very vulnerable. This kind of life could show up here and there, maybe on exoplanets, last for a few months, and then you never be heard of from again. So what means is that these things have to operate in the same global environment for a fairly long period of time. So that already informs you about the planetary and astrophysical environment. You have to find a place where the environment is sufficiently stable, but then it's a relative thing what sufficiently stable is. It depends on the chemistry. So some chemistry is going to be very finicky. Others may survive a, a few tsunamis here and there, or something of that sort. The important point here for my general approach is I want to tell you that there is something which you can call a supply chain, which has to operate over a significant amount of time. And significant amount of time is more than a few days, more than a few months, maybe uh, thousands of years, maybe even a million years. And that is a tricky thing and difficult thing to do. So what kind of chemistry would deliver that? Well, the first thing um, to realize is that kind of chemistry will be multiple step synthesis. It's not going to be just one uh, feedstock produces RNA and you're done. Um, it will depend on the environment, for sure, because it's the feedstocks uh, available on the planet, but they have to come together. And the most successful approach in the last uh, 10, I would say 15 years, to do this is what we, in this new field called Science Sulfidic Periodic Chemistry, and which started with papers by John Sutherland and Matt Palmer here um, 15 years ago. And it looks like this to an astronomer. <laughs> I see already John and Matt kind of horrified. So for the chemists here, they'll say, what the hell is this? <laughs> That's not a chemical network. Yes, of course it's not a chemical. That's how a physicist would do it, with operators. Operator R and operator C. What is operator R? It stands for reduction, which is UV light hits iron 2 and produces a solvated electron in the water. Okay, So that happens, you will see several times. What is C? C stands for, actually I forgot what it stands for, but it's an operator which does cyanide addition. Oh, cyanide addition, C. That's what the operator is. So this is it. In just one slide, you have the whole origin of life, of the building blocks at least. Okay, So of course, uh, the proper way to show this is a little bit more expanded, but I wanted to show it to you in this way because <coughs> uh, the feedstocks have some requirements. This thing, which is HCN, is actually called hydrogen cyanide and is the main feedstock. So all the CNs that you need to build up uh, uh, the future life will have to come from there, and that's why you need lots of it, lots and lots of it. The phosphate, you also need a lot because you know the backbone of DNA and RNA are all phosphate. And you need phosphate for other things. You need it in the solution to actually help some of these chemical reactions. So you need a lot of that. The sulfur species is something which you need. You don't need that much of them, and you can get them from the environment. But remember, I'm describing to you how we are going to link this or match it to a planetary environment. Not some exoplanets, but something like the early Earth and Mars. And so the real thing looks like this. And for those of you who are not chemists, and by the way, this was also modified by a physicist, what you see there. So it's John Sutherland's chemistry, but not the way he wrote it. So we skipped a lot of uncomfortable steps that the chemists don't, that the physicists don't understand. But the important part is here. The most important th thing is it works. So even a second year physics student was able to actually do most of this without, the fact that I can do it means that it can work on any planet. So that's kind of a bar, very low bar. If I can do it, it would work no matter what. 
But what you see here, think of this as pictograms. You know, these are molecules, stick figures of molecules, but uh, don't bother with which molecule and what is this. Think of them as pictograms, two messages. One is there are many steps. The second message is you start there and then the molecules get bigger, okay? So you add stuff to them and they get bigger. At some point, right there, they become so big that they become racemic, meaning that they have a mirror image of each other. So that will be an important point. So, uh, where is that potentially happening? Remember what we needed. We need a lot of hydrogen cyanide, and we need a lot of phosphate. So thanks to David Kaplink and many other people, uh, we now know that this has to be in some kind of environment which we uh, generally refer to as closed basin, evaporative lakes. Closed basin means that there is no river that constantly uh, empties the lake so that the lake water gets diluted. Evaporative means that because there is not a constant flow and outflow, it, its level goes up and down quite significantly. And by the way, dilution is a big problem in uh, solving prebiotic chemistry because a lot of the things that you really need in large concentrations are usually not available. Phosphorus and CN bonds are not that available generally on the surface of the earth. Or if they are available, they are available under temporary conditions which are not that good for anything else. So you need to store them somewhere. And the closed basin evaporative lake is a very good way to store them. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So where would those lakes be on the early Earth? We don't have geological record that goes beyond 4 billion years uh, old, as you know, because of plate tectonics. And zircons, unfortunately, very few and far between to tell us exactly uh, what the early Earth looked like. It seems that it was populated with a large number of islands. Um, and there is a big debate of whether the first continents were sub aerial meaning uh, sticking above the water, or under, just under the water. Uh, no matter what, uh, those evaporative lakes were on small pieces of land. And by small, I mean things which are bigger than Iceland, but smaller than Australia. So the first continents were the size of Australia about, and there are a few of them. Uh, the islands were like um, uh, Iceland and uh, the big island of Hawaii, perhaps, uh, but bigger. You know, that, that much we actually know. And um, Iceland is full of closed basin uh, evaporative lakes. Actually, the Earth is full of closed basin evaporative lakes, despite the fact that we feel otherwise. Now, why do we feel, you and I feel otherwise? Uh, because uh, evaporative lakes, closed basin evaporative lakes, for good reason, smell very bad and nobody swims in them. So we avoid them. So you never go, there are never, you know, a four star resort next to a beach on an evaporative lake. Never. You know? And they usually were used for mining borax, and nowadays they are very popular, again, not for resorts, for mining lithium. You know? The evaporative lakes, very good ones, and we know much about them on Mars. This is Gale Crater Lake. In fact, a lot of the motivation for one of the projects here came from me learning about these uh, evaporative lakes on Mars. And there is the cycle of an evaporative lake here. Uh, my colleague John Grotzinger was particularly uh, insistent that we have to consider this kind of environment, and he has a lot of evidence from Mars about it more so than we have on the early Earth because we don't have the geological record. So of course, evaporative lakes occasionally evaporate, like here. The important thing is that you accumulate sediments, you have a large catchment basement. Um, that is, you have mountains or plains where a large amount of uh, leaching from rocks, um, um, whether this is on an island or on a small piece of continent accumulate in that lake. And then eventually when it evaporates, uh, those sediments uh, are preserved for you in a kind of uh, storage, warehousing, if you will. They could be modified um, occasionally and quite often in those volcanic um, um, 
these are volcanic islands. So they will be volcanically active. You have um, lava flows. You will have hydrothermal systems, which will protrude and actually affect and probably provide a lot of the hydrogen sulfide that you will need um, for the chemistry that will happen later on. And eventually, uh, the wet seasons come along. We are talking here maybe a million years for this to happen. So the accumulation and store of feedstocks can take anywhere from a thousand years to a million years. It doesn't matter. It could happen throughout a long period of the history of the Earth. These evaporative lakes quite often uh, last for that long. In the geological record, usually more than a million years. Uh, you know, especially uh, these islands lasted much longer, it is believed, on the early Earth because the plate tectonics was not as active. So they actually were bigger and lasted longer. Another thing which is very important to note here is that um, a lot of these impacts, you see a little tiny impact here, a lot of these impacts on the early Earth were significant, and they, of course, often, more often, hit the ocean. So when that happens and when the impactor is rich in the iron, uh, which is sequestered usually in the core, even today we get a lot of iron meteorites falling, but these were big pieces of iron, uh, they would produce temporarily a very uh, fairly rich, thick hydrogen atmosphere, global atmosphere on the Earth, which would then switch the chemistry of the entire geo um, atmospheric and water um, interface to be reducive, uh, to have things like methane, hydrogen cyanide in big, big amounts. It's not going to change the availability of iron. Uh, iron is still being, uh, going to be common uh, on those, uh, in those uh, aqueous reservoirs. And a lot of that hydrogen cyanide that is either temporarily available or is slowly being accumulated is going to be captured by, by the iron in what is called ferrocyanide. That is very important to that story because the ferrocyanide both plays a role in controlling uh, the chemistry of those lakes and it seems to play a direct role in making available cyanide as well as solvated electrons for the jump-starting the chemistry that I just described to you, the cyanosulfidic chemistry. So that's ferrocyanide here. And uh, we're quite comfortable with um, um, suggesting that a lot of these lakes were rich in ferrocyanide and cyanide deposits. And they could be stored for a long period of time and then used, and then used in the chemistry which I just described to you. And what I find really uh, striking as a physicist, uh, what I really find striking is that with a simple set of rules and the simple initial conditions, only two operators and a very simple set of initial conditions, you can actually produce six and more than six of the canonical amino acids, you can produce building blocks for RNA, and you can produce building blocks for membranes, which is all you need for life as we know it. In fact, one of the most surprising things to me in that whole thing, looking from the view of astrophysics, is that the chemistry, which is the upper part here, these are amino acids, uh, does not produce amino acids uh, which are non-canonical, meaning which are not used in life today. As you know, there are, what, hundreds of amino acids that are there? Maybe a thousand? I mean, amino acids is a very common uh, family of molecules. Why is this chemistry, which starts with something which has nothing to do with knowledge of what life is today, would produce not one, not two, but six, and actually more than 12, amino acids, and all of them happen to be used by life today. You know, it, to a physicist, this is kind of what we would call smoking gun. It's very curious to me. Maybe my colleagues in chemistry are not so impressed by it, but I am. Now, what the other thing which I'm not impressed by is that it takes them so long to make them. Many steps. So this is what is called multi-step synthesis. And that worries me a lot as a physicist again. Why? Because at every step along the way, you have to keep the yields high 
so that at the end, when you need to make RNA or those amino acids and use them, you actually have enough material. This is called the arithmetic demand problem, and it's well known to chemists who do multiple synthesis, synthetic uh, synthesis of with multiple steps. <laughs> and they know how to tame it. They make sure the yields are high, they stockpile, meaning they produce a lot of something, keep it in the freezer or refrigerator, and then start from the fresh material. And you know, there are many ways in which you can do that, especially if you have a lot of graduate students who have no job prospects and you can keep them in the lab for a long period of time. They can actually finish the job, okay? So, but on the origin of life with the early, that's not possible. You have to find natural way to solve the uh, arithmetic demon problem. And natural way means that you have to have chemistry which is self-purifying self and self-uncluttering, um, um, self if you will. So not only do you need to have high yields, and it's impossible to have high yields all the time, but you need to eliminate undesirable byproducts. And some of the initial conditions, like the UV light, was shown early on by John and Matt that actually helped eliminate some of the stereoisomers, which is great. Um, people have noticed that this is a problem for a long time. As I mentioned, it's not unknown to people in chemistry. But quite often, when astronomers and physicists think about the origin of life, they forget that. They think that, and that's a misconception I had, they think that when you have a long set of uh, synthetic steps like this, you just wait a long time. In astronomy, we have, what, 13 billion years to wait. So you wait, and eventually, it will just come out the right way. But remember, this is a supply chain. You cannot have you know, your economy going if the supply chain happens every million years, once in a while. It has to work all the time. It has to provide everything all the time. So basically, this is not a solution at all. You cannot wait long enough. In fact, uh, most chemists will tell you that for many things, if you waiting is kind of not going to work because it's a lot of dead ends. There is a Bulgarian proverb, which is uh, the neighbor talks to the other one, and says, complains, and says, "I keep cutting it, and it's still too short." So there is no solution. You know, the only solution is to really do it the right way, to find the chemistry which actually works. And that means eliminate stereoisomers and solve this problem with racemization. You cannot have a network in which uh, you carry your left-handed and right-handed molecules all along. Because first, it's just a problem of 50% in yield. You know, I have 50-50, but you only use this one. This one sticks around, but you still have 15% yield. But at the next steps, it will be 5%, and then you will be one in a billion. So how do we solve that problem? So to me, when Pasteur did it, he did it because he liked red wine. You know, these are the tartaric acid uh, crystals that he picked and found that, hey, wine is always left-handed in tartaric acid. So, but. Uh, chemistry is not. Chem chemistry produces both chiralities. Um, to me, the more, I mean, it's a mystery. It's nice to solve it. But to me, the more important thing is uh, to solve this uh, serious problem with having a chemistry which is self-purifying and actually gives you the, uh, the molecules that you need for living generations and generations of cells. So I have to say that uh, when it comes to homochirality, starting with Louis Pasteur, people have a lot of ideas and suggestions, a long list of how to solve that problem. Um, I have to admit that number one through number six are all, generally speaking, suggested by physicists or astronomers. Neither of them works. <laughs> uh, but, you know. The ones that work are seven and eight, because these are actually done by chemists. And uh, they work very well, except not, none of them work in the environments and in the self-assembly situation which we have at the origin of life. 
like the Suai reaction is marvelous. It's the only known autocatalytic uh, reaction that uh, purifies itself. Uh, but it's completely artificial. I mean, it works in the lab, but would not work on any of the exoplanets you will ever discover, Didier. So that's the point. It's, it doesn't work. So here, the reason, and in the reason I and a lot of my colleagues were wrong about that, uh, had problem is because they thought that all you need is a chiral agent, something from the environment, or usually, like fields or uh, particle spin, that will actually put you in the right uh, location, and then it will just happen. Wait a billion years, and it will happen. Then slowly people realize that they have to have a matching amplification going on at the same time. But very few people, very, very few people realize that when you talk about the origin of life and the whole network, you also need to have a way to spread it through the network, to spread the goodness of homochirality to all the types of molecules. Because otherwise, you're never going to finish the project. Forget about you know, getting uh, the accolades for solving the problem. So chiral agent could produce a small uh, enantomeric excess, which again, enantomers for molecules have left and right, chirality. Um, each one of them is called an enantomer. So an enantomeric excess, little e, is how much more you have of one versus the other. So I particularly like spin because one of my uh, mentors and influences, Jack Shostak, kept feeding me those papers by other physicists who had used spin to um, try to solve the homochirality paper, and I got intrigued by it. The problem is that all of them, electrons, this is dissociative electron uh, association, attachment, cosmic rays of beta decay, are what are called dissociative or destructive methods. So they would create small enantomeric excess, but by destroying your product. Remember high yields? That, that, that may solve kind of in a kind of artificial way the problem, but not in the way I want it. So the one that really uh, caught my attention and I spent some money pursuing it was uh, this particular effect, which was discovered 12 years ago or so by Ron Nahman um, and colleagues, which is called chirally induced spin selectivity. So what, what basically the way they discovered the effect, they were pushing electrons uh, through chiral molecules, DNA, actually, uh, as well as um, protein helices, which are like DNA. Uh, uh, and so they noticed that chiral molecules uh, filter the spin very effectively. So the question was, hmm, can you actually reverse the operator, as a physicist would say, and use this in, in the reverse? I have a biased uh, flux of electrons electron spin bias flux. And can I use that spin flux to synthesize one chirality versus the other? So I'll reverse the cis effect here. And particularly because, thanks to my colleagues from planetary science, especially in the Mars community, they were telling me there is a lot of magnetite deposits on Mars in ancient lakes. And what magnetite is, is the most magnetizable um, uh, mineral that we are aware of on this planet or other planets or on exoplanets. It's iron oxide, but magnetite, that's why it's called magnetite. So um, that's, um, after a lot of dead ends and trials, I had a postdoc who had worked with Ron Naaman and he built some equipment for me in the lab. But finally, um, Furkan, Furkan Oksturk, who is the student on the left-hand side here, um, uh, joined in that effort. And we figured out that magnetite may be the solution to that problem in the following way. First of all, we already knew that we will have slabs of magnetite, so there will be a directionality to the uh, uh, spin bias. So if um, some magnetic field produces a spin bias, there will be a directionality. So there was the possibility for a chiral agent. We still didn't know whether amplification would work. 
So then you have to decide where you are going to try and do the job in the network. The first racemic molecules are an obvious place because remember, I want to solve the arithmetic demon problem. So you have to start doing it pretty early, otherwise I'll never get there. Uh, we tried glyceraldehyde, the one in red here first, but it didn't quite, and still doesn't quite work. It was the next one, which comes right after it, which has this long name, which is called the riboaminoxazoline, RAO for short, which really worked. And the reason it worked, and we knew this already from our chemistry colleagues, was because Ario crystallizes, it forms crystals. That was known, had been known for a while. And so there was a very uh, obvious and good way, which Furkan explored here, is to um, combine the very sensitive uh, initiation of crystal formation, which requires molecules to come close to the surface, which is in this case magnetized, meaning the spins are attached. And the goal from kind of a two-dimensional problem to a three dimensions. Because you need volume, you cannot just change a few of the molecules, make them enantomerically pure even, but the rest of them are racemic. You have to really do the, the whole job. Remember, homochirality means 100% enantomeric excess. It's not 80%, it's not good enough. So how does the reverse cis effect work? I mean, it is a cis effect. It's chirally induced spin selectivity, but it's kind of interesting to see how it works. And I'm so happy that you have the old-fashioned thing here. So you have a molecules which tumble and come towards the surface. And uh, in most cases, when a molecule, which is as large as REO, comes towards the surface, they tend to come more often with one end than the other, but it doesn't matter in this case. The point is that there is tumbling and there is some association with the surface. No matter how the molecule comes close to the surface, it will attain temporarily a charge plus and minus the deltas, actually electrostatic charge, electric charge. What does this mean? Well, it's a temporary movement of the electron clouds in one direction, but the electrons uh, as they are moving, also have spin. So that movement means that there will be an associated spin, uh, temporary spin polarization. So you have, obviously, the charge polarization, temporary, spin polarization, temporary. But now, the spins are something which interacts with the surface or near the surface where the spins have been aligned. Not as perfectly as is here, but let's say a line bias. So now those of you who are uh, chemists will recognize this as a singlet and that configuration as a triplet. And you already know that this is uh, more energetically favored than this. Small difference, but makes a big, big change when it comes to crystallization. So that is kind of what is happening here. And this is what it happen, happened in reality. We actually, Furkan got these crystals, this one of the pictures. Ultimately, all of this is good words, good theory, but you have to do the experiment. Uh, experiment is what matters. And so that is what we did. A lot of experiments, um, uh, Furkan did them. I mostly destroyed some of them. I was particularly interested in what it feels to touch this and have these crystals. They're like salt, They're quite, quite durable actually, but, but you can break them uh, easily and they become like, you know, like fleur de sel, you know, nice from Camargue, south of France or somewhere. Anyway, it worked. Uh, the real thing that it worked, of course, is nice pictures. So we can hope to get the front page of some magazine, which didn't quite happen, but almost did, yeah. But this is the crystals of REO. What is more important is when you pick those crystals the same way we Pasteur did, for Khan did it with tweezers, and then you dissolve them carefully in water, and then you put them through the CD machine. CD is the circular dichroism with polarized light, circular polarized light, that was invented by Biot. 
a contemporary of Louis Pasteur. And actually, Bio was the one who made Pasteur do the experiments with tartaric acid in his lab so they could use the CD. So it's basically wherever this organic molecule, in this case, REO, absorbs well, which happens to be actually in the UV, quite often for those it's the UV, you will see a signal, the optical activity, as it was called then and even today, you will see a signal if it's uh, actually chirally selected or not. And it will switch if you change the magnet at the bottom, you know? You switch the magnet and you get the opposite one if it really works. If you have a surface which is not magnetized, we remove the magnetite, we grew the crystals on a silicate wafer or something which cannot be magnetized by anything, then you get a straight line. So, it worked. You got an atomeric success right off the bat at 60%, which is amazing. Um, what is more important is you have to realize that REO is one of several stereoisomers. And you, you can really see that everything else is gone. Solubility is the reason here, but it's important to know. And not only uh, you get a large and antumeric excess, chiral agent, but you also get amplification, which we didn't quite understand in the beginning. You do a second step, and suddenly it hit close to 100%. So only you could get homochirality very fast. And by the time, by the way, this is not a competition, it's not a sports game, but I'll have to tell you, this was really a big advance for anything that other people were doing. People were very happy to publish papers and editors to actually accept them for publication if you got something like this. And we were getting 200%, so which is unusual. And remember, this is not a destructive process, this is a synthetic process. We are actually not destroying product in order to get to this situation. So of course, you would say, yeah, but you did it in the lab, and you're claiming that it happens in those dirty lakes where the surface is rough, and you know, it's not the same situation, right? These lakes are like this. This is happening in the scouring zone, right where you get the salty layer, which you see on that picture in Australia for Khan and me two months ago. You see the white layer, these are salts, not area, of course, uh, but that is kind of the image in your head. These kind of evaporative lakes go up and down. Uh, it rains occasionally there, it's dry, but it rains occasionally, so uh, these crystals get washed off and then new ones will form later. Actually, which is very important, but that I will leave for John or Matt to explain to you some time in the future, is you have multiple uh, pools Evaporative lakes, a single lake usually when they're fully uh, in full capacity, but when they dry down, the topography of the bottom basically connects several poles which are connected to each other. And we actually were seeing it there, and you could see the salts propagating from one pool to another, which is actually important in that picture, but for reasons I'm not going to tell you now. Also in Australia, we actually visited this place, which is one of those early is preserved, almost three billion years old uh, evaporative lakes in Australia. It's called Tumbiana. You can see some of the structures from the evaporative layer. Again, the bottom of the scouring zone where this chemistry and crystallization happen is a slab-like, uh, rough but slab-like structure similar to what you see on that lake, Gale Crater Lake on Mars. These are not um, kind of strange uh, topology places. They're actually the bottom uh, evaporative lake. We didn't quite understand how the amplification worked until we did more experiments. And here, our colleagues in Weizmann Institute helped us. The people who actually have discovered, did discover originally the uh, cis effect, uh, Ron Naaman and Josip Pautil, and we figured that one out. We call it now avalanche magnetization. So what really happens is when these crystals form, uh, the underlying um, magnetization of the layer doesn't have to be uh, very biased even. It's slightly biased by the magnetic field of the Earth, but then the crystal itself 
induces by the same effect, the polarization of the spin, the temporary polarization of the spin, induces an avalanche of aligning the spin around where the crystals were forming. We saw it like uh, microns away from the crystals, many microns, even millimeters away from the crystals uh, propagating. What does this tell you? It tells you that when you're on the edge of this lake and this process happens more than once or twice, you're going to uniformly magnetize, um, you're going to mag uniformly magnetize that surface eventually in one direction. Not only that, but the coercivity which you get is 20 times stronger than the magnetic field of the Earth. So even the magnetic field of the Earth flips or disappears, that magnetization of, on, on that lake is going to remain the, there, the same. And it's going to produce really good homo uh, chiral crystals for you. And so, a summary, uh, this turned out to be very efficient and to work very well. So one a last thing which I want to address before I end is going back to this. So the supply chain is important and homo chirality early on is important in order to make it work. And you need the time in order to develop functionality. And that relates to the chemistry, most of all, but also, again, to the planetary environment because that functionality happens in the same environment in which you synthesize those. And where you synthesize those monomers, you need UV light. We talked about UV light already. So UV light is necessary because otherwise you can't synthesize the monomers. But then, over all this period of time of the supply chain operating, you have to deal with the UV light when your molecules are bigger. The first thing that you need to deal with is obviously the damage versus um, survival. How do you find that balance between damage and survival? So my lab has been very kind of uh, worried about that. And we are making sure that the monomers as well as the polymers that um, produce and that are necessary are actually photostable. The second one is actually we see it as an opportunity. It's not all bad. In fact, I would say it's not bad at all. It's great. But we have to understand what the opportunities um, um, you get from um, um, this UV light. And it has to do with the emergence of molecular fun function. Uh, things like what you see here in a paper by some of my colleagues, Z-Way, of course, in the group of John Sado and Sam, um, Meng, Su, uh, where they are finding some of this uh, functionality among molecules that resemble functional RNA molecule in cells today. This is actually an analog of, um, a mini analog of tRNA. So the UV light you have to, of course, acknowledge that on the early Earth you have UV light, which we call UVC, which affects those molecules but also has enough energy to actually do something. Present UV light is blocked. UVC light is blocked by the ozone layer. And you have to understand that in those lakes, UVC light doesn't penetrate very deep. It is uh, actually quite blocked. We call this project, which is, we are still publishing on it, the Dirty Water Project. The penetration of UVC light is fairly short. That means that you can have some functions which use the wavelength dependence. And one of them is what we call self-repair, which uh, means that UVC, UVC light can cause damage, but it usually causes it at wavelengths. This is a particular type of damage known in DNA and RNA uh, at 245 nanometers. But the repair we observe to happen beyond 280. So wavelength dependence is very important, and you can achieve it in those lakes because you have such a gradient sensitivity to depth. And uh, if you can actually do it, you have that balance. That balance, which uh, is between damage and self-repair, res re resembles what happens in your cells today. With DNA, there is a special enzyme, which is called photolyase, which releases electron from visible light, solar light, and solves that problem. 
Self-repair is when you don't have that enzyme, and then you need UV light to release the electron. That um, effect, known in um, DNA, was actually discovered relatively recently, also within the last 10 years, and one of my postdocs, Corinna Kufner, is in the group which actually discovered DNA self-repair. The big question was, of course, what about RNA? We know DNA self-repair is sequence selective, so you already have interesting functions that work in some cases, but not in others. Uh, what about the RNA? So, and how do you find out? We have this equipment, which uses a laser pump probe spectroscopy at the femtosecond level, which allows you to see uh, le uh, uh, transitions which normally you wouldn't see, and which last for a very short period of time, picoseconds. If you, see, if you see them in the infrared, then you can actually, which allows you to see them in the infrared, then you can actually understand what is going on. So Corinna did some of those experiments, and maybe not surprising, but very satisfactory to all of us, we found that RNA behaves in the same way. This is actually what this spectra look like. It's actually spectral lines as a function of wavelength or wave number, which is reverse wavelength. But this is between six and seven microns. This is time. So these are stacked spectra on top of each other, many, many spectra, which is the laser system produces for you. And you see here the formation and expiration of those charge transfer states. G and A and G spectral lines are always there, but the transfer states don't last very long, picoseconds but lasts long, long enough to enact the self-repair in RNA in the same way in which it works in DNA. And remember, nobody knows of any enzymes that repair RNA in our cells today or in any cells today. So this is a truly prebiotic mechanism that doesn't work in any other way. And so this is the wavelength dependence which we see in other molecules. This is another one which switches at 340 nanometers and switches off at 260 nanometers. Again, you see it in the spectral lines if you do excitation in one versus the other. The bottom line is it gives you an opportunity to find switches and um, molecules that do function by using environmental factors as well as, of course, the chemistry that they need to enact. So to finish here, just uh, going back to the supply chain and functionality part, it really tells you a lot and constraints what that environment should have been. So far, that interaction has been very positive. Anything that our chemists have discovered seems to have a good match to an environment which we can identify on the early Earth or Mars, and vice versa. We are trying to actually sometimes advise them that certain environments or certain reagents do not exist in that environment and they should not consider using them in their prebiotic chemistry. And so what are the timescales involved? The short ones are obvious, ours today, but um, the long times are probably not more than a million years. We have to get to self-reliance and we don't know how long that takes. So I would give it a few thousand years at least, uh, and certainly I don't think a planetary environment will allow us to do it for more than a million years. So I want to thank my team, and thank you for your interest in that and coming today. So, thank you.